All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for doing this Zoom. Sorry, I had to keep switching schedules and plans. What's going on is my wife is out of town. My dog uh, cannot be left alone because he will lick this wound that he has and it's gonna get it infected and it's bad. So I've got him, I could actually show you him. He's sitting over here with me. You see him down there. So yeah, so I'm keeping my eye on him. And uh, that's why we're doing it this way. <laughs> Normally, my either my wife, Carol, could do it, or I could find, you know, find a friend to come hang out. But nobody was available today. So this is what's going on. Okay, so that's my explanation. Now, let me jump into our uh, topic, see if I can remember how to do all this. So we are being recorded. Uh, all right, let's see. I want to share my iPad. Hello. All right, that's working. Good. Okay, you can see, correct? You're seeing a, something that looks like math. Great, thank you. Okay, so where we were was we were um, doing a certain integral, integral of sine x over x from minus infinity to infinity. And um, let me see here. I, so notability has changed itself on me. Where's my laser pointer? Is that this? Yeah, okay, good. So um, we, we said that a strategy for dealing with this kind of integral was to use this indented contour where we go along the real axis then we indent around a pole. So, I mean, we were considering doing this instead of sine x over x. Uh, we explained it's better to deal with e to the i z rather than sine of z. So that's why we've got this. And instead of x, we have z in the denominator. And so we're integrating this function in the complex plane, but we pointed out last time that that function has a little problem uh, unlike this, which has perfectly good limit at x equals zero, this function has a problem at z equals zero, has a pole there. And so that's why we're, we're indented this little semicircle. Um, and so we did that last time. And our, our observation was that if we consider this funny indented contour, then it doesn't have any singularities inside. And so its integral will be be zero by Cauchy's theorem. But then we broke that up into several contributions. There's these integrals from along the, the real line, and then an integral over this little semicircle, and then one over a big semicircle. And so where we got to last time was we pointed out that, um, so here's our four integrals on that path. We pointed out that if we look at the limit of the semi, little semicircle going to zero and the big semicircle going to infinity, that um, the contributions from here and here on the real line, those two would add up to uh, the integral we want, sine x over x, except because we're doing e to the i z, we're gonna get cosine plus i sine. That's why I have this i here in front of the integral I'm interested in. Um, and the cosine contribution canceled out by symmetry. So the integral over the real line was giving us i times the integral that we want. All right, and then we also showed that the integral over this little semicircle uh, we did a calculation. We found that it gave us minus pi times i. And so what I want to do today is finish the calculation. Um, I can Maybe I'll just tell you right now what's going to happen, which is that we're going to show that the integral over the... Oops, that's a pencil. I don't want that. We're going to show that the integral over the big semicircle... That's going to go to zero. And that's going to occupy the whole lecture showing that. So uh, I'm not going to do that yet. Why don't you just take it for granted that that will go to zero 
in this limit of um, as big R goes to infinity. So we're going to see that. But that's not, I'm not showing that yet. But if you accept that that will be true, then what we would get for our results back up here is that we've got I times big I coming from this gamma one and gamma two. We've got this negative pi I coming from the little semicircle and putting everything together will give us I times big I minus the semicircle, the pi I, and then plus the zero that's gonna come from the big semicircle. All of that will add up to the zero that we get by Cauchy's theorem. And so that's a pretty simple equation that you can solve to show that then um, big I is going to equal pi. And so that's the ultimate answer that we're looking for. Um, I mean, that will be the answer to our problem. Big I referring to this integral that we're interested in. We're going to show, I mean, this, this argument will show us that this all equals pi. Okay, but what it's predicated on is this step. That's the key thing. So before I dive into doing that, let me pause here and see if you have any questions. Um, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. If not, um, just type something in the chat. Maybe I will. Can someone try to unmute themselves just so I can hear if there is actually a question? Hello, anybody out there? Or can you not unmute? Hello? Yeah, hi, Will. Thank you. Okay, all right, good. So unmuting is possible, um, but I'm taking it there's no questions. If there were, this is your chance. Nothing? Okay, so now what is so difficult about this um, calculation? Why, why is it hard to show that the uh, integral over the semicircle is zero? So we want to prove e to the i z over z dz goes to zero as big R goes to infinity. And here's why it's a bit tricky. Um, until now, the, the kind of technique we've used for something like this is our trusty friend, the ML estimate. And the ML estimate does not work on this. It's not strong enough. So maybe I should begin by showing you that that doesn't work. Instead, we're going to need something fancier called Jordan's Lemma. And so I'm going to explain Jordan's Lemma today. But first, let's understand why the ML estimate doesn't do the trick. So the ML estimate is not. Uh, strong enough to show this. Let's just see why not. So if we just tried it, we would say, well, all right. So we would have to calculate the maximum um, I mean, M would be the max for points on this big semicircle of the magnitude of the integrand. And L would be the length of the semicircle. Which is just, it's a semicircle, so pi times the radius. And the, you know, the difficulty here is that the length is going to infinity as R goes to infinity because it's getting to be a bigger and bigger semicircle. The radius is going to infinity. So you have this length going to infinity, 
But we're hoping that M goes to zero fast enough that it can overcome the growth of the length. The trouble is it doesn't go to zero fast enough. So let's see what this is. Um, for one thing, the modulus of Z, that's just, it's we're on a semicircle. So that's gonna be one over R. And so really it boils down to understanding what is the max of the magnitude of E to the I Z on this semicircle. Um, all right, so I mean, when I multiply those two things together, M times L, the R's cancel. Notice I have one R in the denominator, one in the numerator. M times L will be one over R, the maximum magnitude of E to the I Z times pi R, to cancel those R's. And let me now try to understand what this max is. So remember, I can't say e to the i z has a modulus of one. That's only true e to the i times a real number. This is e to the i times a complex number. So I have to think a little more carefully. Um, e to the i z, well, that's e to the i. Now, if I'm on a circle, CR, um, Z on this, CR means that Z is of the form RE to the I theta, where the theta is going from zero to two pi. I'm oh, sorry, zero to pi. So um, when I'm calculating E to the I Z, that would be e to the i, and then weirdly, I have to put r e to the i theta up there in the exponent. It's kind of weird to have an e and then an e in the exponent, but that's what we get. And then if we expand that out, that's going to be e to the i. Oh, by the way, I'll be posting these notes later. So you, I mean, you're welcome to take notes or you could just grab these. I'll post them on Canvas if you just want to watch. But anyway, so e to the i. R cosine theta plus I sine theta, like that. And that then multiplies out to be E to the I R cosine theta times, then I have an I times an I makes a negative one. So E to the minus R sine theta. And now if I take the modulus of both sides of that, because I'm interested in the maximum of, of this modulus on the circle, then I would be getting the modulus of this term times the modulus of this term. And the modulus of that first term, well, that's just e to the i times something real. So this is gonna have modulus one. Whereas the next one, um, sine theta is positive on the semicircle, right? Because that's just the y coordinate up there. So this is just going to be uh, e to the minus r sine theta. That quantity is itself a positive quantity. Um, and so this is my magnitude of e to the i z. It's just e to the minus r. sine theta. And the question was, what is the maximum of that thing when we're on the semicircle? I mean, it might be a little clearer to just think of it as e to the minus. It's really just e to the minus y for all points on that semicircle, if you look at their y coordinate. So if you just think about it for a second, you know, if I've got a semicircle like this. It starts here at a y of zero at a very high, you know, it'll ultimately go up to a y value of r. Then it will be back down to y equals zero over here. What is the largest e to the minus y? Um, you can see that's going to occur when y is zero, right? Otherwise you're getting something exponentially small, e to the minus r, which was a gigantic number. So this is going to, 
you know, way up here, e to the minus y is tiny, but here, e to the minus y is going to be e to the zero, which is one. And so that's our max. It's, it's occurring at these endpoints. So the max of this for z on the circle occurs here. And it equals one because you're getting e to the zero. Okay, so why is that important? Because remember in our ML estimate, coming back here, my ML, you know, now that I've done all this work, um, I can see the max is one. So my ML is, well, let's put it this way. M times L is going to equal, what did we have? Just pi times the max. And that's pi times one we just showed. So this is pi. And the problem is that does not go to zero as r goes to infinity. In fact, it's just some, it's just saying ml is pi for all radius r. So this is this is not giving us what we want. Remember, in all these problems, we always want to show that the integral on the big semicircle is zero as the radius goes to infinity. And so far, all we can conclude is that, um, I mean, what is the conclusion? What we have so far is that the magnitude of e to the i z dz over the semicircle is less than or equal to our ml, which is equal to pi. And so, it's true. I mean, in fact, that integral is going to be zero as r goes to infinity, and that is less than pi, but we are not getting a strong enough bound to convince ourselves that it's zero, at least not yet. And so to do that, we need this special trick called Jordan's lemma. So I'm going to start discussing that now, but let me pause here to make sure you understood the, the reasoning that's pushing us to need something stronger than the ML bound. Do you want to ask anything about this argument? Um, not seeing anything. Gonna scroll through. Nope. All right. Well, so let us continue then. So onto Jordan's lemma. What is that? So it's it's tailor-made for situations like this where the ML bound doesn't work. And let's go back and see what we've got here. Um, the key thing in, in Jordan's lemma is to look at this object right here. This e to the minus r sine theta. We didn't make much use of it. I mean, if you remember, what we did with it was we just said, well, this is e to the minus y. And then we used a really crude bound on this, which was we just replaced this by, by one, the value we get by plugging in y equals zero. And that's kind of wasteful because this is a really small quantity over much of the semicircle, right? It's exponentially small. We've, we're not making any good use of this giant term, the r in there. So what I'm trying to say is that this quantity is extremely tiny over most of the semicircle, basically almost all of it, which is why the integral goes to zero, that even though we're going over a long length, that's only growing like r, the length, whereas this, these values are exponentially small in r, and that exponential will crush the, the r, except there's just this little difficulty in the neighborhood of these two points where sine of theta is zero and that's messing up our, our infinite r. So 
So rather than just focusing on what's happening at, at these worst case points, which is what we did so far, we're gonna make use of the smallness of this um, and actually try to do the integral over this whole semicircle. That's gonna be a more refined calculation. So that's what Jordan's lemma says to do. Whoops, I want a pen. Um, Whoa, that didn't work. <laughs> Used to be better at this. Okay. Um, so what's our strategy? Let's look at this again. Basically, Jordan's lemma is a way to show that this e to the iz over z dz over c big R and related integrals. So I'll talk about the generalization of this at the end, but for now, let's just focus on this one. A way to show that this goes to zero as R goes to infinity. Uh, all right, so let's dive into it. Let's look at this again. Um, so I'm interested in e to the i z over z d z over c big R. Now um, we're going to not exactly do the integral. It's we're going to put an estimate on it. We're going to try to put an upper bound on it, and we'll show that the upper bound itself goes to zero which is gonna mean that this integral goes to zero. And so our strategy is, let's look at the magnitude of this quantity and ask, using a kind of triangle inequality argument, what's an upper bound on this? And so think about what this means. We're taking the magnitude of an integral and an integral is a sum. Right, an integral is an infinite sum. Think of it as a Riemann integral. So we're doing an absolute value of a sum. And by the triangle inequality, that's going to be less than or equal to the sum of the magnitudes. In other words, there's a bound here, which is that this magnitude of this integral is less than or equal to an integral where I take the magnitude inside. And then I would also have to take magnitude of dz. And so I want to do this over the semicircle. This is by a kind of triangle inequality, but for integrals. Rather than for finite sums. Um, okay, so now we want to estimate the magnitudes of those different quantities. Now, um, dz is not hard to think about. I mean, if you picture what's happening, you know, like sort of in Riemann, some terms, we've got this semicircle, and we're moving from point to point along it, and then this little infinitesimal step is some length, dz, you know, like that. And so you could ask how long is that in magnitude? And you should just think about it by drawing, you know, that's just from high school geometry, whoops. Um, if I just look at the length of that, that's a little, this is the origin here. This is a circle of radius R, remember. So that's just, um, I'm sweeping out a tiny bit of theta and R d theta is going to be my magnitude of dz, where d theta would refer to this angle in here. So I hope that's plausible. 
Uh, now, all right, fine. So that's, so in fact, what we're going to do now is convert this integral over the semicircle in the complex plane to an integral over theta. And so earlier I showed that the magnitude of e to the i z over z, we showed previously that that was equal to e to the minus r sine theta. We'll say recall. We did show that. Uh, I'll just scroll momentarily back to where we did that. I think that's um, right here, right? We showed magnitude of, oh, wait, did I mess something up? Yeah, I did. So magnitude of e to the i z is this. But then I also need to divide, we had said this over Z. So I better be careful. I think I forgot what I was doing. So the magnitude of E to the I Z over Z is this over um, the radius. Okay, looking good, I think. And so now, um, when we go back up here to our triangle inequality, this, if I replace the different magnitudes, this one, I'm gonna replace with this. And the dz magnitude, I'm gonna replace with this rd theta. So, um, All right, so e to the i z over z in magnitude times magnitude of dz over the, this is all over the circle CR. This converts to an integral in theta of e to the minus r sine theta uh, all over big R times big R d theta. And now that's a theta integral, so I'm going from zero to pi. And notice those r's conveniently cancel out. And so I'm left with the task of analyzing this integral, zero to pi, e to the minus r sine theta, d theta, where I have canceled out this with that. And this quantity of interest, um, remember, this is an upper bound on the integral we're interested in. And um, so the upshot that of what we have so far is that the integral of e to the i z over z dz over cr, which is what we want to show goes to zero. We've shown so far that this is less than or equal to by our triangle inequality, this integral that we're faced with right now. Whoops, I don't want that in the, down there. I want it up in the exponent. And so we've reduced the problem to estimating this integral on the right. Um, let me pause there. Questions about the reasoning at this stage? No? For some reason, I don't see the chat because of the way I'm sharing my screen. I've forgotten how to see it. So yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing the chat. If you're posting anything in the chat, oh, wait, there it is, chat, nothing. Okay, all right, well, no questions then. Typical Zoom situation here. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
All right, I'm going to take a little T because this is this is where we got to really limber up our muscles. This integral on the right, this e to the minus r sine theta d theta, you'll you've never done that integral, I'm guessing. It's a bit nasty. I mean, we did we don't know an antiderivative of that. Um, it's an exponential of a sine function. Weird. So how do we do this integral? That's the next question. Um, you could ask Wolfram Alpha, obviously. And I don't think it could do it either. I don't know. I didn't check. You could, you're welcome to fire it up if you want. <laughs> you can definitely do it numerically. But remember, the answer depends on R. So, so you'd get a function. And the question is, what is this as a function of R? So we don't know any antiderivative for this. Um, so here's what I guess Monsieur Jordan figured out that is so clever, which is, although we can't do the integral, we can put an upper bound on that upper bound. This is a classic move in analysis. Okay, Calvin, big reaction. <laughs> Some people would say that analysis is the study of inequalities. So whereas calculus was the study of equations and all the neat things you can do by, by manipulating equations, in analysis, we often work with inequalities. We can't, we can't figure out what things equal, but we can put bounds on them. And so here we're gonna put a bound on this bound and we'll show that the upper bound on the upper bound itself goes to zero. And that's going to be enough to show us that the integral over the integral we want, that this thing goes to zero. So watch this. It's so clever. This, I mean, normally I don't do proofs like this with you, but occasionally I do if I think they're great. And I think this one's a really great proof. Okay. So what's our move? Um, let us think about this a bit more. See what's going on. So, um, the book doesn't make any fuss about this. It just writes down the trick. But I, I want you to really savor it and appreciate it. Uh, so let me see. What did I do in my notes? I had some little. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to visualize what's happening a bit. First of all, let's think about what sine theta is doing. All right, so I'm focusing on this. Let's just look at that sine theta. Um, over the range of interest. So we're going from zero to pi. Sine of theta looks like this. Right, just an arc of a sine wave. Um, negative r sine theta. Well, it would look like the negative of that. Oh, come on. So negative R sine theta would be something like this, where here we are at pi over two, this point would be down here at negative r. These guys are at zero. Then if I take exponential of that, so e of e of this curve that I've drawn down here, what is that going to look like? So I'm trying to build up your intuition for what is this integrand. What would the graph of that be like? So 
Okay, well, let's look at the endpoints. E at, e at the left endpoint, that's E of zero, that will be one. And then E at this endpoint will also be one. This is set pi. And then what happens in between? So, well, like here at pi over two, we're gonna have e to the minus r, which is a very, very tiny number. It should be close to zero. All right, super, super tiny. And, and actually all throughout this region here, say, where these numbers are like, I mean, even, even here where it's halfway down to minus r, I, then I'd have e to the minus r over two. That's like e to, you know, minus a billion over two. It's practically zero. So in fact, the function is gonna look like this. Here it's one, it's gotta be continuous, but it's gonna come screaming down to the neighborhood of zero. And then it will quickly spike back up. I haven't drawn it perfectly, but you get the idea. Over most of its range of integration, it's very close to zero. It's only near the endpoints that it gets close to one. And so we're asking ourselves to figure out what is the area. I'll put an upper bound on the area, which is this area in here, right? Very, very little. That stuff. Okay. Um, so, that's just to give you a feeling why this integral should be small, the area under this curve. But now, since we can't do the integral, here's the clever trick that Jordan figured out. Maybe some of you can even see what to do, or if you've read ahead in the book, you already know what I'm gonna say, which is if we look at um, this function, let's look again at sine of theta. Now, oh, by the way, uh, before I do that, think about the area under this curve. You, can you see that the whole thing is symmetrical? That whatever we're getting over here in this half is the same as what we're getting over here in that half. It's two pieces, right? It's symmetrical around this midpoint, pi over two. So you could check this analytically, but the integral that we want is really, I mean, remember, we're trying to go zero to pi e to the minus r sine theta d theta. I'm claiming that that's just two times the integral if I go halfway, zero to pi over two. Uh, I didn't leave myself enough room. So I'll move over. Hopefully that's believable to you. And so now I'm going to just focus the rest of my attention on this integral um, right here, going from zero to pi over two. So let's do that. And then the sine function on that range of integration, well, again, not drawing it so well, but sine of theta from zero to pi over two roughly looks like that. And Jordan's clever idea is that, remember, I'm trying to find an upper estimate on this integral, an upper bound on this upper bound. So the difficulty here is I don't know how to integrate e to the minus sine theta, but I do know how to integrate e to the minus theta. That's the cool idea. If it, if it didn't say th sine theta, if it just said theta, I could do e to the minus theta d theta. I mean, it looks weird, but like you know how to do e to the minus x dx. That's just integrating an exponential. We all know how to do that. So the problem is I don't like sine theta up there. I want that to be theta. And so that's, that's the key trick. Um, what Jordan says to do is draw this. Mm 
Mm, actually, I don't like it in black. Let me make that stand out more. Draw this line. Now, what I'm doing is I'm connecting the endpoints of this arc of the sine wave. And I mean, what is this line? This is the line which goes through the point um, one after traveling a horse. So rise of one, run of pi over two. This is the line, if you like, well, or I mean, this is the graph of the function. Two, uh, I want to do it in red. Sorry. Two over pi times theta. What I'm showing is just by this little picture that, you know, by inspection, sine of theta is greater than or equal to two theta over pi for theta in this range that I'm interested in between zero and pi over two. Now, why is that a good observation? I mean, that's true. You can see the curve is above the dashed line, but why is that helpful? Well, because this gives me an upper bound on the integral I don't know how to do. It says, since sine of theta is, since sine of theta is greater than this, if I replace this sine theta by this quantity, I will have something smaller in the, up here in the exponent, but watch how this works. This is a smaller number, but it's got a negative sign in front of it. So it's a smaller negative number in the exponent, meaning it's closer to zero, which means that this will be a bigger quantity because it's e to something less negative. Right, so what I'm trying to say here is that, um, e to the minus r sine theta is less than or equal to e to the minus r two theta over pi on this interval. You might have to think about that for a minute because of the negative sign, but it's e to something less negative when I when I do this. You want to ask anything about that move? Um, if you're okay with it, then we're almost done because we would now say, let's, let's remember the chain of logic that we're developing here. We've got back to what we were trying to do originally it was e to the i z over z over the big semicircle dz in magnitude. Um, I mean, maybe I should summarize. This is like where we are so far. We're arguing that this integral we're interested in is less than or equal to uh, what, it was zero to pi e to the minus r sine theta d theta. And we're now saying that that's less than or equal to, there was that factor of two, and then I'm going zero to pi over two. But now I'm going to replace my integrand with this better one e to the minus r two theta over pi. And then I have to do that, d theta. And the beautiful thing is we can do that final integral. I don't like how this has gone off the page. 
So excuse me while I, ah, let's try that again. No, I'm not going to get to do what I want to do. I want to lasso this. Come on, you demon. There, move over. All right, so let's do that last integral. We can do it. Um, what is it? I mean, it's basically e to the minus a constant times theta. So, so what do I do? I, if I have to do something like, this is of the form e to the minus a theta d theta, where here my a is what? Negative, no, not negative. Um, I already said negative. It's uh, two r theta, two r over pi. Okay, so if I were doing this integral, this is what it's e to the minus a theta times negative one over a or something. Right, that'd be the antiderivative of the e to the minus a theta. So here, um, this one that I'm trying to do is what? I guess I don't want to follow up the negative signs. Let's see. I think I'm getting mm, well, hold on. Let me do this carefully. say two say two two then I'm going to go negative one over a so that would be negative pi over two r then I have to say e to the minus the a which is this two r theta over pi. And then all that is evaluated between zero and pi over two. Um, I can cancel out these twos. And I think I'm getting that this equals pi over r, and then e to the zero is one, and then minus, and plugging in the theta of pi over two, e to the minus r. And actually, I don't, the r is going to infinity. I don't wanna go wild here, but I don't need this term right here. This is really, kind of irrelevant. This term is important. I want to keep that. I'm not going to say that's zero. But, but what I can say, just to be consistent with what's in the book, the book makes the remark that this is less than or equal to pi over r. This is true for all r. So, so what's going on? What we've done here, if I go back, is actually, I really want to copy this whole thing up here. Let me duplicate this. Duplicate. Oh, hello. Okay, come down here. Man, I wish I could do this on a blackboard. Actually, I want to make this smaller. Whoa. Me likey. Good. And so um, what I've just shown is that this is less than or equal to pi over r.
And so you see, we're getting what we want because now with this brilliant estimate, as R goes to infinity, we have just shown that this, this is less than some quantity that is itself going to zero. And so that shows that that integral is zero. Right, I mean, this, this referring to this goes to zero as R goes to infinity. And it's nice, it's even showing us the rate at which it's going to infinity. It's going at least as fast as one over R. And so hence this goes to zero as R goes to infinity. QED. Okay, so we have shown that that integral over the big semicircle goes to zero. That's um, that's what we were trying to do. Is there any question then about this argument? It's great, right? It's really a clever idea. Now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, sure, professor, you got a lot of pleasure out of that, but what do I need to know? So what you need to know is um, when to use Jordan's lemma and when it's adequate to just use the ML estimate. And so um, Jordan's lemma is, um, is applicable to situations where you've got integrals that look like this. So here's the generalization. I mean, the book discuss discusses a thing that they call the generalized Jordan's lemma. So you can see this, they, they call it lemma 5.4.3 in the book. And so they do essentially the argument I just did. Um, and they apply it and show that this kind of argument that we just did works. Jordan's lemma applies to um, any integral of this form. I mean, it's always when you're dealing with pieces of a big semicircle. Um, actually, they don't call it a semicircle. It doesn't have to be a full semicircle. It could be an arc of a big circle. It doesn't have to be half the circle. It could be less than that. So they apply it to, for a little more generality's sake um, to something that they call sigma sub r. So this is an arc of a circle. of a radius big R. So um, the picture looks like this. I've got in the complex plane, draw something that looks like this. Where you've got A big piece of a circle sitting here. This is radius R. This is radius R. This thing is called sigma sub R going that way. And it goes between two angles that they call theta one and theta two. And it applies if the integrand is of the form, an exponential, like we had e to the i z. In general, you could have any e to the i constant times z, um, where this constant s has to be a positive number. We had it equal to one, um, but you need that to be positive in order to be getting the exponential smallness of the um, integrand on the upper semicircle. It's of anything like this times any function f of z, for us, that function was one over z, but it doesn't have to be one over z. It could be any f of z with certain properties. Um, so where 
we need a couple of things. One, you need the S to be positive. And two, you need the F of Z. Um, it's not that F of Z has to go to zero. What, what you need is, let me uh, say it this way. Come over here. What I need is that the max of the magnitude of this f of z, the f of z is whatever is multiplying the exponential term. The max of the f of z on this arc that has to go to zero um, as r goes to infinity. I mean, in our example, for us, we had S equals one and we had F of Z was one over Z. But, but this is more general. The other thing is the F um, just has to be a continuous function. Very mild assumptions on F. In particular, it does not have to be analytic. It could be, it doesn't matter if it is or not. You don't use that. You just use that it's going to zero. So um, this is the generalized Jordan's lemma and, and where it gets used is when um, the F is, I mean, what, what's the issue here? Again, why can't we just use the ML estimate? Well, there's this competition where the D, this term DZ, the L is growing like in proportion to the radius of the circle, right? L is some piece of a semicircle or another arc of a circle. This DZ is growing in proportion to R so this f of z better go to zero fast enough um, to overcome the fact that this is growing like r. And so, but the cool thing with Jordan's lemma is that it says, actually, f doesn't have to go to zero very fast. This exponential does a lot of work for you. It's giving you exponential smallness. So as long as f goes to zero at any rate, doesn't matter how fast or slow, as long as it goes to zero, even extremely sluggishly, that is good enough. Whereas um, an ML estimate would require the F to go to zero faster than one over R. But because of this exponential, we don't really need that. We just need F going to zero. So that's, um, I mean, I guess my punchline would be, uh, You need Jordan when f of z goes to zero slower than um, one over r. If, if F goes to zero faster, like if it's one over R squared in magnitude, then you don't need Jordan. Um, also keep in mind that you can only use Jordan's lemma if you've got this exponential term here. That's very important. The ML estimate doesn't require the exponential. The ML will work on any integrand. This is a very particular kind of integrand that has an exponential times a function that's going to zero. And this kind of thing comes up a lot if you've ever seen Fourier transforms. This, this kind of exponential times a function, it looks sort of like a Fourier transform of a function. So this kind of object does come up a lot, but um, it's, it's a little, in some ways, less general than the ML bound, but it's also stronger. 
So I think that's all I have for you today. We're um, done about 10 or 15 minutes early. So I'll stick around if you want to ask any questions. Uh, thanks for coming. I'll see you in person on, on Thursday. I think my wife is coming home Wednesday, I hope. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, could you scroll down to the... Thank you, Professor. Thank yeah, you you're welcome. You want me to scroll down to yeah. this part? Thank you. Yeah, I could have tried to explain a bit more what I mean there. Or did you have a question about this part? Oh, I just wanted to see the last line, what you had written about. Uh, yeah. Lemon. So, right, it's it's when the maximum of F, I really should say, when the max of F of Z is going to zero more slowly than one over R. Um, or, or as slow. Uh, you know, like in our problem where we had one over Z, that's, grow, that's going down like one over R. So maybe I should really say, yeah, a little more accurately would be, it's going to, sorry, going to as slowly or even slower than one over R. Um, yeah, but if it's going faster, if it's one over R squared, even if it's one over R log R, anything that's faster than one over R, the ML estimate will be good enough. Let's see, I do see some comments in the chat. Okay, thank yous. You're welcome. Appreciate that. What what exactly is like the formal statement of Jordan's lemma? Yeah, like good, we did right. the whole, yeah. You're right, I didn't say. So yeah, let me go back. Um, I think, it's it's funny about that question because um i all right i'll just tell you what the book says the statement is Th this is the statement of jordan's well wait uh what is their statement the book statement of jordan's lemma is is this that that this is less than or equal to this. That's what the book calls Jordan's lemma. That inequality, that that integral on the left is less than or equal to pi over r. That's what they call Jordan's lemma. Um, Got it. Okay. Thank you, you. If you look that up in the book, so actually, I could share my screen with you. Uh, here, let me not share my um, iPad, but let me just share the book. So let's see here. If I go to the desktop, uh, so where's the book? Here's the book. Yeah. There, that's visible to you, right? Yeah, I can see it. So you see lemma 542. They say Jordan's lemma, this inequality, e to the minus r sine theta d theta less than pi over r. So they call that Jordan's lemma. Now, other books don't call it that. Other books um, would say, like they might call this thing Jordan's lemma which the book calls the general version of. I, I, this to me is a bit weird. I've never seen this called Jordan's Lemma, but okay, that's how they're referring to it. I, I think of that as the key step in the proof of Jordan's Lemma, but whatever. It's the, this whole constellation of ideas. Um, any other? Questions or comments? Uh, I had a question when uh, about what you said about regarding the ML bound. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you said that we can't use the ML bound. Um, like when can? So the question is when can we actually use the ML bound? Right. So let's let's look at that again. Let me write on the uh, 
I'm going to share my iPad again so we can discuss that. Yeah, I mean, there's a theorem about the ML bound, but what we can even derive um, what the right conditions are. Let's just look at it. I mean, when is the ML bound? I guess, yeah, let me write that out now. So when is the ML bound? sufficient to show that, I mean, I'm doing some contour integral. I've got some F of Z and I'm going over a big semicircle. If I want to show that this goes to zero as R goes to infinity. So when is the ML bound good enough? Well, just apply the ML bound. And so we know that this integral I means so the ML bound would say that this is less than or equal to the max of F in magnitude over the semicircle times the length. And because the length is pi r, So, I mean, let me just call this M. Um, so I will delete that. Think of it this way. This, this um, max is what I'm calling M. And it does depend on R. And it's times the length, which is pi times R. So in order for this to go to zero, you need um, MR. I mean, M of R has to be, well, when it's multiplied by R, you need that to go to zero. So in other words, you need M of R to go to zero much faster than one over R. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's just that, it's what I was saying, that the M has to overcome the growth of the radius. So anything that, you know, like if I had um, a function that was behaving like one over Z squared, that would be adequate because then the M would go like one over R squared. Okay, thank you. So that's, that. yeah. I mean, the way it's often phrased, um, here's, here's a good kind of, kind of uh, situation. Often if my F of Z is of the form of a polynomial, like if it were a rational function, you know, so that this is a polynomial divided by a polynomial. If I had one polynomial divided by another, then the key thing is I need that I have enough powers of Z in the denominator. I have to have at least, well, you want the degree of Q, meaning the, the highest power, the exponent of the highest power or whatever you wanna call it. So you need the exponent of the highest power in Q. Like if it, if it was a polynomial that began with Z cubed, then it would be degree three. So you want the exponent of the highest power in Q to be greater than or equal to the highest power in P plus two. In other words, you have to be at least two powers greater to use the ML bound. If it's only one power greater, 
like if it's z cubed in the denominator, but z squared in the numerator, that's not good enough because that's only one power. That's only going to behave like one over r, which is not enough. Do you see what I mean? So I need I need two extra powers or more of z if it's a rational function. I don't know if that's over explaining it or not. Other questions? Okay, great. So I'll see you all on Thursday. Bye-bye.